Hey guys, this is Craig Migliaccio from AEC Service Tech, and today what we're going over is how the liquid line solenoid valve works, and we're also going to go over the troubleshooting. So I'm going to take this whole assembly apart to show you how it works. We're also going to be powering the assembly, or actually the coil inside here with 24 volts, and you're going to see the stem move up and down on the inside. We're also going to do some testing with our multimeter for the resistance value on the coil. This here is a direct action liquid line solenoid valve, and when you power the electromagnetic coil up here, you are opening the pathway and allowing the liquid refrigerant to travel through. And when you take power away from the electromagnetic coil, it's going to see a disc down in here and it's going to stop the refrigerant flow right here. And so this can be found on some heat pumps with a long line set application or where the heat pump compressor is located much lower than the rest of the system outside where it may be in a low ambient condition. And what the point of this is, is to stop the liquid from migrating to that compressor because that will be bad at the startup of the compressor. And so this can also be found on automatic pump down refrigeration systems. And I'll be showing you that application in just a little bit. But right here is your electromagnetic coil and you have your two wires that attach to the coil and your ratings right here. This one happens to be a 24 volt coil. And here you have your enclosed assembly up top right here. And I already loosened this. And right here you have your, your iron core. And so you have the weight of the iron core is dropping it down when this is uh, in the vertical position as well as your spring pressure pushing it down. Now when you power the coil up here, it's going to suck this iron core upwards. And when you uh, take the power away from the coil, it's going to allow it back down again. And when it's down, it's going to be pressing down on the disc right here. You can also see that little rubber piece right here is going to be pushing right in the middle. You also will notice that there's a slit in the iron core all the way up and also a hole right here. And that's so the refrigerant can actually get up above this assembly as well. And so this is your disc and that just rests on that little ridge right down there. And if you see the arrow, the refrigerant travels this way up and then down through that hole. That little screen is to protect from any debris so that the disc can go ahead and seat properly down on there. And the disc just kind of comes up and down right below those threads. Uh, and, that's, and that's it. So the refrigerant pressure will be pushing this up when the, the electromagnetic coil has power to it and the refrigerant can come through. But when the when there is no power over here, you're going to have the weight of this iron core and the spring holding this disc down. So now I want to go over and show you the operation of the electromagnetic coil. So here you have an iron core and you have a spring and this is going to be up inside of this enclosed shell and the weight of the iron core is going to be wanting to have it fall down and also the spring pressure is going to want to push it down. And if we put a permanent magnet and we slide it down, it's going to suck that upwards. And so that's what's going to happen right here on this electromagnetic coil, anytime that you power the coil. And then when you take the power away from it, it's not going to be magnetized anymore, and you're just going to have this iron core fall right down again. Here we have a 24 volt transformer hooked up to these wires, and I'm going to apply power here, and you're going to see this sucked inwards into the enclosed shell. Now I'm going to turn the power off. So that shows the magnetic force when power is applied and when it's turned off. To see if the coil is intact, what you can do is just check the electrical resistance across the coil and make sure that it does not read OL. So if it reads OL, then that means it's open and the coils burn out. And so you can just test it just like this. The actual resistance value measured is going to be different from coil to coil, depending on the amount of wraps on the inside and also the voltage rating of the coil. Another way to test if the solenoid coil is intact is to take a current reading and you see that one of our wires is going through the AC amp clamp and so we're going to be measuring our amperage right here. So a way to determine if the coil is intact is if it draws current when you apply power to it. Now you got to make sure that to not remove this coil from the solenoid valve and power it because that coil will burn out. So if you notice, I left the iron core in the middle, so the, the electromagnetic coil is still going to be doing some work, and so it's not going to go ahead and burn out. You're going to see this iron core is going to get sucked in. Now I'm going to power it, and you see that we're drawing about half an amp, so 0.55 amps. Now I'm going to turn the power off. Now in the previous example, if we drew no current when we were powering the coil, then we would know that that coil was actually burnt 
apart and open. But before you condemn that coil, you'd want to check to make sure that you definitely are supplying voltage to that coil. Now let's look at an application where the liquid line solenoid valve is installed on a refrigeration system. So how a pump down system works is once the indoor box reaches its set point, the solenoid right here is going to shut off the liquid line flow. And what's going to happen is the subcooled liquid is going to stop right here and it's going to be stored in this receiver tank. So the refrigerant flow is coming out of here, coming this way. It would normally come through here, through the site glass and over to the thermostatic expansion valve at the indoor coil. But if this shuts the liquid flow off, it's basically going to back up into the receiver tank. And the receiver tank's job is to store subcooled liquid refrigerant. So you want to have these three components in the order that you see here. The thing is, it would be beneficial to have the sight glass over right before the thermostatic expansion valve if possible. But if not, this location out here is okay as well. But basically what you want to do is you want to be able to see while the system is running on the sight glass, you don't want to see any bubbles. You want to just see a clear liquid going through there. And if this was right before the thermostatic expansion valve, then you'd be able to tell that you're not losing subcooling before you're getting to the thermostatic expansion valve. You want to make sure that you have a full liquid flow to the TXV in order for the metering device to operate correctly. The second reason that you want to have the sight glass after the solenoid is when the solenoid shuts off the liquid flow, you can then watch the sight glass and make sure that you don't actually have a little bit of liquid getting through there. So say this got hung up partially and it's not doing its full pump down procedure, then you'd be able to tell by looking through the sight glass. If you want to learn more, make sure you check out our website over at acservicetech.com where we have calculators, quizzes, articles, we have our podcasts. And if you want to learn about the refrigeration cycle of a walk-in box, make sure you check down the description section below. Hope you enjoyed yourself. We'll see you next time at AC Service Tech Channel.